Kirby's Superstar released well towards the end of the Super Nintendo's life, and as a result it felt like a real culmination of everything developers had learned up until that point. Now the most unique aspect of this game is the fact that it's made up of 8 different experiences that on their own would have been far too short to release. For the most part it's a 2D platformer that carries over many of the mechanics from Kirby's adventure and sees you being able to swallow your enemies and absorb their unique properties. There's a wide range of powers for you to consume, may that be boomerangs, bombs or wheels that let you dash around each level, but if you hit whilst under the effect of them you'll lose it and only have a small window of time to regain it by eating it again before it disappears. New to Superstar was the introduction of the ally system, which would go on to become a staple of the series and it saw you being able to call on your friends for help at any time. They're usually controlled by the AI, but it's possible to hook up another controller for a second player to jump in as well, making it one of the best co-op experiences on the Super Nintendo. Visually, Kirby Superstar simply oozes personality and style. All of the sprites are big, colourful and wonderfully detailed, even down to the individual facial expressions of the characters. This same attention to detail is carried over into the levels themselves, with plenty of animated backgrounds that bring a real sense of life to each environment you find yourself in. This is easily one of the most graphically impressive SNES games out there that has stood the test of time and looks just as adorable and vibrant as the day it released. The Super Nintendo was home to many RPGs that had a lasting impact on the genre. Hits like Final Fantasy and Chrono Trigger more than proved that when it came to providing fantastical adventures, the Super Nintendo was more than up to the task, leaving behind the then common medieval setting and instead opting for a futuristic sci-fi backdrop to convey its story, Star Ocean throws you into the role of Ratix, a soldier who finds his village in ruin and learns of a mysterious virus that's turning the townsfolk into stone. This prompts him and his friends to leave the comfort of their small town life and explore the world and galaxy for a cure that soon reveals a far grander conspiracy that holds the fate of the entire globe in its grasp. On the gameplay front, it's your typical RPG fair with exploration playing a huge role as well as battles which all play out in real time. You're free to run about the battlefield and as you would expect you've got a wide range of attacks to pull off as well as special skills and the ability to wield magic which is essential to get used to as nearly every enemy you encounter has either a weakness or affinity to these attacks. Using the experience gained from these battles, your characters will not only gain higher stats, but you'll also be able to teach them new skills and more importantly new items. You'll eventually be able to produce new types of food that increase the power of your weapons or allow you to summon stores in the middle of dungeons, making it one of the most pivotal aspects of the game. Star Ocean is a very different RPG, especially when compared to its contemporaries on the Super Nintendo. It offered a lot of new ideas that would be refined find in later games, but it's still an enjoyable adventure to make your way through. Pocky and Rocky is a top-down shooter that trades in the common rockets and lasers of the genre for something thoroughly based in Japanese mythology. You take up the fight as a young Shinto shrine maiden known as Pocky, who along with her cute raccoon sidekick are tasked with taking out the evil Black Mantle, who has unleashed a mysterious curse upon the kingdom. Your journey takes you through several levels where you're constantly cut off by various enemies that all present their own unique threats. And like any good shooter, you've got a range of ways to deal with them, but the most common being and cards that can be thrown in their direction, and by shooting a basket or killing a group of floating fireballs you'll grab yourself a power up, which either restores health, powers up your weapon or gives you a bomb which damages all of the enemies on the screen. As with many shooters, waiting for you at the end of each level is a boss, which are meticulously designed both visually and mechanically, making them by far the biggest obstacles to overcome throughout your time with the adventure. Now when it comes to the graphical makeup of the game, Parky and Rocky hits it out of the park with its huge emphasis on absolute chaos as everything unfolds. The amount of objects on screen at any one time is highly impressive, especially considering that each sprite that's used possesses a great amount of detail as well as animation that's all delivered at a blistering 60 frames per second. The Japanese aesthetic permeates throughout every aspect of the game, and you'll be visiting beautifully rendered shrines, villages and parts of the countryside that really convey a sense of serenity. If you're looking for a new shooter to get into, make sure you don't pass up on Pocky and Rocky. 
I'm sure like many of you watching this video, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a huge part of my childhood. May that be the comics, TV shows, or more importantly, the several video games that released. It's something that I just couldn't get enough of. And when Turtles in Time hit the scene, it felt like something too good to be true. Originally released in the arcades, Konami did a fantastic job of bringing it over to the Super Nintendo, with nearly every aspect of the experience intact. Of course, a few concessions were made in order to get it up and running, but what we ended up with was something nigh on identical to the arcade release. You get to choose from one of the turtles who this time around actually play differently out on each stage. The reason for this is the fact that each turtle has a different weapon, with each character's range and movement speed actually mattering. Donatello gets a staff, which is long and has good range, but is slower and therefore he can't attack as quickly. Rounding out your arsenal is a unique special move that's most effective when facing down one of the many bosses, but also quite a good idea to pull off when the screen is literally lit with enemies. Now when it comes to the presentation, Turtles in Time matches its incredible gameplay with slick visuals that are fully reminiscent of the show or comics that inspired it. Every level looks visually stunning, from the dark skies of the opening stage to the prehistoric forest you'll visit later on in the game. The turtles themselves as well as the various enemies literally pop off the screen with lush and vibrant colours that are only matched by the surprising amount of animation that comes along with them. Sure it's missing a few frames when compared to the arcade version, but what Konami managed to do with the limited power they had was still quite impressive. The Super Nintendo was responsible for catapulting the fighting genre into the mainstream with undeniable hits like Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat, but when it comes to the most graphically impressive, Gundam Endless Duel is a fine example that looks just as gorgeous all these years later. Much like its source material, you take on the role of a pilot who fights alongside their own specific mechs that all have their own unique movesets and properties that make each and every one of them a real force to be reckoned with. As with most 2D fighters, you've got your basic low medium and heavy attacks which can be strung together to perform combos, along with your special moves that can turn the tide of a fight in the blink of an eye. What makes this system a bit different to the similar games on the console is the way in which your moves are tied to a finite amount of points throughout each match. You've got 300 in total and every time you let off a special move, it trickles down and carries over to the next round. If you're not careful, it's easy to have to end up solely relying on basic attacks, so choosing when and how to use your special moves is vital to your success. Graphically, Gundam Endless Duel is simply stunning. Each mech packs with it a ton of detail to the point where they look like they've been pulled straight out of the anime, with each movement and attack being accompanied with impressive animation, lending each of them a true sense of weight as you battle it up. Each attack and super move is followed by a range of special effects that light up the screen each and every time you connect, giving the action a real cinematic quality that fans of the show will instantly fall in love with. When it comes to fighting games on the Super Nintendo, Nintendo, it really doesn't get much better than Gundam Endless Duel, so if you've never got around to it, it's one fighter that absolutely deserves your time. Parodius is a side-scrolling shooter that's known for its out-of-this-world characters and enemies and its very Japanese aesthetic. If you think shooters such as those in the Twin B and Cotton line of games are what playful creativity is all about, you've seen nothing until you've indulged yourself in the bizarre dream world that is Parodius. Much like other shooters, the basics are the same, with it all being split up into a selection of levels that you must make your way through by hopping into a ship. A total of 16 are available, each with a slightly different assortment of special weapons, and you've got many obstacles to overcome if you want to make it to the end, so trying out each of them and finding one that suits your approach is essential. Just as important as your ship is the character you choose as well, as each of them all come along with their own special skills, which really help out during some of the more hectic moments in the game. Of course, a game utilising this much creativity has to look and sound good in order to pull it off. Fortunately, Parodius succeeds in this aspect too. The enemies are detailed and wonderfully animated, from the lowly penguin to the mightiest boss, with plenty of sprites that not only rotate but zoom in and out as well, and some of these designs feel like they were created in a fever dream. The backgrounds are colourful and diverse, with plenty of moving parts, creating an environment that is just packed full of life and humour. Overall, Parodius truly delivers a little something for everyone, as even those who aren't fans of the genre could easily be drawn in by the colourful and appealing aspects this game boasts. It's a strange, out of this world experience, but it's all pulled off so well like you just won't want to put it down. 
Demon's Crest is the third in a series of side-scrolling platformers that began on the Game Boy with Gargoyle's Quest. You once again fill the role of a powerful dragon known as Firebrand as you hope to locate five mysterious crests of various elements that grant their users special powers. The gameplay is spread across six levels with plenty of obstacles waiting to stand in your way such as spikes, fire and not to mention plenty of enemies that all act in their own distinctive ways. Luckily you're more than equipped to deal with the threat as Firebrand can infinitely fly and shoot fire to keep them at bay. As you slowly progress and take out the several bosses that make up the adventure, you'll gain these crests which grant you new abilities. From stronger fireballs to being able to crash through walls and harness the power of the wind. What makes it a bit different however is that Demon's Crest incorporates some light RPG mechanics that expand the gameplay and gives you even more options when it comes to mopping up the enemies. There's one village in the game that acts like a shop, where you're free to buy magic scrolls and augment your abilities that have a noticeable and meaningful effect when in the field. Now visually, right off the bat you were treated to some of the best animation and sprite work on the Super Nintendo, from each intricately detailed creature to the somber and atmospheric backgrounds that give the game a daunting feel of never quite knowing what is waiting for you in the darkness. The gothic, almost repressive ambience of the game is what makes it so memorable and it's a far cry from the other platformers on the system with its mature theme being front and centre. If you loved the first games in the series and others similar titles like Super Ghosts and Goblins or Castlevania, then Demon's Crest would be right up your street. Based on the popular TV show of the same name, Tiny Toons Adventure was yet another side-scroller for the Super Nintendo, but instead of sticking to the basics, Konami decided to experiment, and actually ended up producing one of the most innovative platformers of its time. As Buster Bunny, you must navigate six different levels and get to grips with the many ways you can traverse each environment. This is mainly by dashing and flipping, which soon become a huge part of the basic gameplay. By carefully flipping through the air, Buster is able to attack enemies and wipe them off the screen to reduce any danger, but by dashing you can swiftly climb up walls so when there's nowhere else to go but up you've still got some options. This mechanic however is beholden to a meter that slowly depletes the more you use it and can only be filled back up by finding specific items or waiting around long enough for it to regenerate. Of course, graphically this is where Tiny Toons really excels and ends up being one of the better looking games the Super Nintendo produced. Naturally the cartoon aesthetic from the show was replicated as well as it could be and considering the limitations of the hardware, Konami once again proved that they were masters of their craft with each of the six levels offering up unique environments for the player to explore. From the wild west to a moving train that sees all manner of techniques being deployed in order to create them. Character sprites are fairly large with plenty of personality and charm with many fan favourites feeling authentic to their cartoon counterparts. Visuals such as this are what make not only this title but the Super Nintendo in general so special. If you can find it for a decent price, Tiny Toons Adventure would make a welcome addition to any SNES owner's collection. Castlevania Dracula X once again follows the escapades of Rick de Belmont, where Dracula's been up to his usual evil deeds, this time kidnapping his girlfriend among several other people and it's up to you to enter his castle and send him packing one more time. Much like the previous games in the series, you've got a selection of tools to help you achieve this goal, with Belmont's trusty whip making a return that's used to take on enemies, from skeletons that throw bones at you, zombies that roam the halls, and flying monstrosities that stop at nothing to take you out. Rounding out your options are axes, knives, boomerangs and holy water that all have a role to play in how you approach each threat, but by far the biggest aspect of the gameplay was a then new mechanic known as item crush. Each weapon has a different effect when used with it, for example when using the boomerang dozens of them will appear on screen bouncing all over the place hitting everything in sight. The use of this mechanic becomes more and more useful the further you make it into the game with several chaotic situations being able to be overcome with a simple tap of a button. Now when it comes to graphics, Dracula X is a clear step up from the previous entry on the console and incorporates many impressive effects that contribute to the overall dreadful atmosphere of the game. From the warping flames of the first level to the nail-biting encounters with Dracula himself, it was by far the most visually pleasing journey through Dracula's ghoulish domain offered to us at the time and even manages to hold up pretty well to this day. All of the weapons when used normally or with item crush have some pretty good animations that accompany them and the same goes for Belmont and the enemies that never look out of place against the well-defined backgrounds. Although it's nowhere near the best in the series, Dracula X is still a worthy ride to jump on. 
Yoshi Safari is essentially an on-rail shooter that was all built around the Super Scope add-on for the Super Nintendo. It was a light gun shaped into a rocket launcher that allowed players to interact with the on-screen action, and much like what the Zapper and Duck Hunt ended up being to the NES, Yoshi Safari was the Super Scope's killer app. The premise sees Mario and Yoshi on behalf of Princess Peach searching Jewelry Land for the King and Prince who were kidnapped along with several magical gems. This takes the form of various levels that sees Mario riding on the back of Yoshi with a very familiar looking cannon in hand. Yoshi automatically moves forward and it's the player's job to shoot the enemies that come towards you, whilst making Yoshi jump at specific points on the track. For anyone familiar with Mario, the enemies will instantly be familiar, with bullet bills, coopers and goombas littering the screen, and occasionally you'll encounter larger enemies that include mech driving boos which prove a far greater threat. Making life harder is that firing the cannon consumes power, and when the meter is empty, the rate of fire decreases until it's charged again. But this isn't nearly as limiting as you might think, as it fills up relatively quickly. Now presentation is where Yoshi Safari shines and takes advantage of the Mode 7 technique allowing for a pseudo 3D presentation that although seems crude by today's standards, but at the time it looked absolutely incredible. Nintendo's impressive sprite work is on full display as well, with plenty of characters and objects that rotate or zoom in and out of your view, all brilliantly animated, which is most prominent during the boss encounters. Overall, Yoshi Safari feels like an essential game to own for the Super Nintendo. Sure, it's a bit on the short side, but there's still plenty of fun packed in, and when coupled with the Super Scope, it's something that just never never gets old. Well that does it for today's video, keep an eye out for the next part as that will be coming up soon, so don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell to get notified about new videos which release every Monday and Thursday. You can follow me on all of the socials which are linked below to stay up to date and also join my growing community on Discord to meet many like-minded gamers to continue the conversation with and to take part in giveaways. I'd like to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters Rhino, Skill Jim, Shuden, Richard, Amy, Daniel, Dio. Omar, Strider, Pierre, Carl, Awesome Jacket Dude, Maximus, Scott, Alfred, Terry, Ryan, Alex, GameCube Galaxy, Chris Salaryman, Fake and Paddy J for their continued support that helps make these videos possible. If you're interested in joining my Discord or supporting the channel through Patreon, you'll find all of these links down below. As always, thanks for taking the time to check the video out. I'll catch you next time.